the ANA is honored to be hosting tonight's presentation, uh, Inflammation is Repair Deficit, the Physiology First Approach to Diabetes with Dr. Russell Jaffe. Dr. Jaffe is an internist, molecular biochemist, clinical pathologist, nutritionist, and diagnostician. Dr. Jaffe received his BS, PhD, and MD from the Boston University School of Medicine in 1972. He was on the permanent senior staff of the NIH until 1979 and is board certified in clinical pathology and in chemical pathology. Dr. Jaffe is the recipient of the Merck, Sharp, and Dome Excellence in Research Award, the J.D. Lane Award, and the U.S. PHS Meritorious Service Award. He was also named an International Scientist of the Year by the International Biographical Commission for his contributions to medicine, biochemistry, and clinical immunology. Dr. Jaffe is the founder and president of Perk LLC, a quality-driven professional nutrition company, and is a fellow of the Health Studies Collegian. Moreover, Dr. Jaffe is a longtime friend of the American Nutrition Association. He's spoken to us multiple times throughout our decades as an organization, has been very kind and generous to our organization in more ways than we can express. Uh, tonight, I'd like to thank Perk Integrative Health, which is a sustaining member of the American Nutrition Association and has helped to make our mission possible. With that, it is an honor and a pleasure to introduce Dr. Russell Jaffe. Thank you, Michael, and greetings to all. Thank you particularly for such a gracious introduction and for the opportunity for us to share a rethinking of something common to almost all disease, that is inflammation, and a rethinking that allows us to see opportunity in the form of repair deficit, a reframing, a re-understanding, a novel rethinking of inflammation. And where our rethinking comes from is from a physiology first approach, which will apply tonight to diabetes, but is equally applicable to any understanding of health from a health perspective, in contrast to where I came from originally, which was pathology orientation. Each have value, but in terms of functional health, we think that physiology first is more rewarding and that has led us to rethink fundamentals of healthcare, including the fact that inflammation really is repair deficit. And let's see together the evidence for that, but first some housekeeping details. You are welcome to watch and listen if your computer is so enabled, or you can watch on the computer and call a toll-free number, which is 1-866-640-4044, and when prompted, enter the code 8404428, and you'll be allowed to listen on your phone while you watch on the computer. Phones will be muted until the question and answer time, uh, and at that point, you can either, when they're unmuted, ask your question or send it through the chat, uh, which you'll find in the lower left or right of your screen, depending on the screen. Well, with that, let's get into our topic. First of all, a rethinking, something we're privileged to be able to do, and a rethinking of inflammation, which, as you can see from this diagram, is at the heart and usually at some level of cause in regard to everything from, if we look straight up, cancer, then to the right of that, cardiovascular diseases, which we'll be touching on some tonight, Alzheimer's senility, diabetes, where we'll be focusing tonight. But as we continue around arthritis and the autoimmune diseases, neurologic diseases, pulmonary diseases, inflammation amplifies and often causes these conditions. And inflammation then is central to our understanding of the loss of good health and to understanding its restoration. So rethinking inflammation is worthwhile, especially if it gives us something to do rather than to observe, if it gives us something actionable uh, in the uh, health promotion area uh, rather than just something to fight. Now, with regard to diabetes, a brief review. Diabetes is really about energy coming from sugar regulated by insulin. So diabetes is really an energy dysfunction because sugar isn't converted into energy under the guidance of insulin 
in appropriate ways. We used to think there were only two kinds. Today we know there are more than two kinds of diabetes. There is type 1, that is the insulin requiring or insulin dependent, what used to be called childhood diabetes. And there's a new type, type 1.5, where you have both insulin dysregulation and insulin resistance together. Then there's type 2, non-insulin dependent diabetes, what used to be called adult diabetes, but we see increasingly in younger people. And type 3, which is the combination of both type 1 and type 2 in the same person. So there are now four different types of diabetes. Type 1, insulin dependent, an autoimmune condition that's based on destruction or dysfunction of the pancreatic islet cells that produce the insulin. The type 1.5, where you have the combination of insulin dysregulation and insulin resistance together. Type 2, the non-insulin dependent, which is uh, often associated with uh, obesity. Another autoimmune condition where anti-insulin or anti-insulin receptor antibodies play important roles. And then type 3, where you combine type 1 insulin dependence with type 2, that is insulin resistance. And for more information on the bottom of most slides, you'll find either a reference or a link uh, for further investigation. There are many books and perspectives on the importance of uh, cardiac and sugar metabolism, from syndrome X to the omega diets. And tonight I'll be sharing a very specific point of view Let's start with the conventional view and then progress to the physiology rethinking view. So let's look at insulin resistance as it's most conventionally understood. And by that I mean that there are genetic links that have not yet really been clarified but are presumed by many to contribute either to obesity, as you see on the left, or to inactivity, as you see on the right. And the general view is that age is an important independent variable, each or all of them contributing to the development of insulin resistance that then leads to type 2 diabetes and hypertension and dyslipidemia and atherosclerosis and the PCOS and NASH syndromes. But from our perspective, we can look with deeper understanding and rethink this relationship Noticing that genetics is important, but that epigenetics may be more important. If you look at the best data from the National Institutes of Health, 92% of our health is determined by our choices or by epigenetics. 8% is determined by our genetic background and is quite different. So a tiny amount of our health quality or competency is conferred upon us by the choice of our parents or our genetics. Most is actually due to epigenetics, due to things we can choose to change, we can choose uh, more wisely, and modulate or modify our risks through the habits of daily living, or what in a more technical sense is called epigenetics. And when we rethink insulin resistance from this perspective, we find the Upstream influences of epigenetics and genetics do influence obesity, and they do influence sedentary uh, lifestyle. But it's really the inactivity, it's really the too much sitting and too little moving that accelerates the loss of function that we call aging, and that increases the probability uh, of weight management issues and obesity, which then feed into insulin resistance. And yes, coming out of insulin resistance are all of these consequences, and we'll look at some of those uh, further in the uh, webinar. Now evolution does, evolution does favor predisposition towards obesity, what's called the thrifty genotype, and here you see different uh, art forms that archaeologists have uh, uncovered uh, through their excavations. Uh, and the uh, indication that um, weight management has long been uh, an issue for humans. 
in regard to our own country and obesity, the United States is about 6 billion pounds overweight. This contributes to a loss of productivity, a loss of health quality, and to high costs. And if we look across the country, we see quite a bit of difference state by state in terms of obesity and diabetes rates. Uh, in these bar graphs, the obesity rates are in dark blue and the diabetes rates uh, in uh, light green. And you see that the 11 most obese states are significantly uh, more likely to have a proportion of obese uh, citizens than the 10 least obese states. And the difference, if you look at the far right, uh, is 7.9% difference in obesity rates and 3.8% difference in diabetes rates, substantial variances across the country. And we'll now look at that in a bit more detail. This is data from the Center for Disease Control. On the left, you'll see obesity mapped out by state, and on the right, diabetes. And here we see 1994, the year 2000. You see the colors are getting a bit more intense, indicating an increased proportion of both obese and diabetic citizens. 2006, significant acceleration of the proportion of obese and diabetic people in the population. 2009, still further extension, has not yet plateaued. And if we look at this on one single slide, you see that over the last few decades, America really has substantially increased its obesity prevalence and its diabetes incidence and prevalence. This is a challenge because the higher proportion of obese and diabetic people in the population yields downstream consequences of more chronic degenerative autoimmune illness with higher costs of care, higher morbidity, loss of quality of life, uh, and uh, all of those consequences. So if we look at where the molecular biology uh, helps us, we can simplify the relationships that insulin provides in the body by looking at this simple diagram. And if we start from insulin in the resistant, in, in, in the middle of the slide, when insulin comes out, you see the arrow pointing up towards the liver and crossing the line of liver releasing sugar from glycogen into glucose because insulin inhibits glucose production. It stimulates glycogen and it reduces the release of blood sugar from the liver uh, through the hydrolysis of glycogen. And insulin also enhances glucose uptake by muscles this decreases blood glucose further. And when insulin is functioning properly, there's a dynamic balance between the pancreatic release of insulin in response to changes in blood sugar that then modulate both the liver release of sugar and the muscle uptake of sugar to keep the blood sugar in a constant state. You may have heard and you may increasingly hear about the importance of glucose transport Glucose transport is summarized by biochemist as GLUT, G-L-U-T is the acronym for glucose transport proteins, and these uh, are enzymes or catalysts in the membrane of cells that move glucose, quote, downhill, energetically downhill, into or out of cells. And if you follow from the left to the right, you will see that when the GLUT receptor, the glucose transport protein, is empty, and insulin is present from the outside, glucose can come in and sit in that receptor. The receptor is then energetically flipped so that it's now inward facing instead of outward facing. That's the middle of the five states. And it releases to the inside of the cell in the next picture, the glucose. And then the final picture where the empty receptor flips back so that it's facing out and available for another glucose molecule to come in. So this is our understanding of how the glucose transport receptor works, and this is modulated uh, favorably by insulin, uh, and it reduces its functionality when insulin resistance 
uh, is observed. Now, what about insulin lack and the fueling of cells? If you look at the left where there's a lack of insulin, the insulin receptors do not have insulin and the glute transport system, the glucose transport system, remains bound to interior vesicles. The glucose transport system remains inside the cell and the cell is not able to benefit from the receptors bringing sugar in. Indeed, one of the things that insulin does, as you see on the right, is to stimulate these vesicles to bring the glute transport proteins to the outer membrane of the cell so that the cell can draw the glucose in uh, under the influence of insulin. So the lack of insulin at the receptor not only impairs sugar availability for energy, it actually uh, prevents the glucose transport protein, the absence of insulin, prevents the glucose transport protein from going to the right place on the exterior membrane to function. So we must have insulin in order for the glucose transport system to work correctly. Now, insulin resistance goes, does go on to diabetes. Initially, the insulin response in healthy homeostatic people lowers blood sugar so that it keeps the blood sugar in a normal or homeostatic or self-correcting range. But over time, muscles often decrease their response to insulin because of too much sugar being available and too much need. This then leads to a lack of responsiveness to insulin. The liver decreases glucose production from glycogen lactate and pyruvate, glycine and glycerol, and the net result is that the blood sugar level goes up outside the cell because the inside of the cell lacks the sugar to make energy and sends the message that it needs more sugar to make energy. So the blood sugar level goes up, but the insulin is not able to open the gate and let the sugar in, and so the blood sugar rises in proportion uh, it's a physiologic adaptation. The body is trying to raise the exterior blood sugar so more of that sugar can get into the cell for energy, but because the insulin receptor is not as responsive, uh, the uh, message is not completed and the blood sugar remains elevated. What about the link between type 2 diabetes and obesity? Well, diabetic patients are usually, but not always, obese. Um, the non-obese diabetic patients tend to be more brittle uh, and uh, show signs of either toxin overload, toxins that can affect uh, their pancreatic function, uh, or toxic metals that can bind to the receptor for insulin and alter it in a way that's negative for insulin response. The insulin resistance and obesity are part of what we call metabolic syndrome or syndrome X, depending on where you're trained and your preference, and it includes high blood pressure, HBP for high blood pressure. It includes ASHD, arteriosclerotic heart disease. It includes CAD, coronary artery disease, and it includes PVD, peripheral vascular disease. All of these are consequences or results of metabolic syndrome, and metabolic syndrome is really insulin resistance uh, incarnate. Now, adipose cells or fat cells get involved. And there are a variety of hormones that help regulate blood sugar and fat metabolism. And these include tumor necrosis factor, TNF-alpha, leptin, ACRP30, also known as adiponectin, resistin, and stem cells. Uh, all are important and are modulated uh, by a lack of insulin resistance in their effort to help correct the problem uh, and make more sugar and energy available to cells. This is work from Sons and his group that appeared in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, and it's about fat cells. And I want to particularly point out uh, that in the fat cells, uh, you'll see macrophages. Uh, the fat cells are in yellow here. The macrophages are in blue to purple. Um, and when uh, there's an increase in fat pad due to weight gain, there's more oxidative stress. There's more ER endoplasmic reticulum stress. There's more endothelial damage from this oxidative stress. Free fatty acids go up, and adipocyte necrosis occurs. 
when the adipose tissue is inflamed or has a repair deficit, then there's insulin resistance. And this insulin resistance uh, is systemic, uh, but it is also associated with an effort of the body to try and repair this excess fat by sending in dendritic first responder cells like macrophages, and the macrophages then recruit stem cells and other cells to come in uh, so that in many obese people, uh, perhaps half of all their stem cells may be in their fat pan. Now this has given rise to some efforts to do liposuction and harvest stem cells. Uh, we think that's physiologically inappropriate, that you really want to decrease the repair deficit so that the stem cells can go back into the uh, rest of the body uh, and not remain in the fat pads uh, trying to repair incompletely the excess uh, of repair deficit, also known as inflammation. Now, fat tissue from obese mice or obese humans are resistant to insulin. A decrease in insulin response to glucose uptake from cells. There's also a decrease in levels of insulin receptor. So you can have a decrease in production of the receptors in the cell, or you can have a binding of uh, toxic metals or other foreign substances as haptins that distort the receptor uh, and make it less available when the insulin wants to bind and activate. And all of this causes a decrease in adiponectin uh, production. Now, obese fat learns resistance. So obese fat is not resistant to insulin automatically but rather fat tissue, when there is an accumulation of repair deficit, becomes invaded by dendritic cells, first responder cells, and they then recruit the stem cells. These are repair needs that are unmet, and this repair deficit is what's called inflammation. Macrophages are the indicator cells. They produce pro-inflammatory hormones like the tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF-alpha, and interleukin-1. Uh, when this repair is blocked or reduced. And these are physiologic responses of the body uh, to um, increase the reactivity uh, to insulin so that the sugar can get in and the energy can get made. Now, this diagram relates insulin resistance uh, to a number of conditions, including atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis. And insulin resistance is associated with hyperinsulinism. So the insulin goes up, but very often is bound to antibodies against insulin so that it's present, it's immunoreactive insulin, but it's not functionally available because it's been bound by an antibody against itself, or because the insulin, while elevated, meets a receptor that is altered and uh, not as responsive to the insulin signal. Insulin resistance is associated with impaired glucose tolerance or sugar tolerance. It's associated with an increase in triglycerides or hypertriglyceridemia, um, a decrease of HDL at the same time that the blood lipids or triglycerides go up. And this hypertriglyceridemia is the body's physiologic response to a low energy state and it says, well, if I can't get my energy from sugar, I can back up and get the energy from a backup system uh, from fats by metabolizing them. And so the blood fats rise when insulin resistance is present, and they go down when insulin resistance remits. And insulin resistance is associated uh, with essential hypertension. Uh, otherwise unexplained high blood pressure uh, is often associated with insulin resistance, and all of these lead uh, to prediabetes or diabetes, and to accelerated hardening of the arteries or atherosclerosis. Now, we're going to turn our attention to the relationship between chronic stress and insulin resistance because they go together. And then we'll talk about some studies we have done in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes uh, and some successful outcome studies using this physiologic approach to their management. And here we see the first uh, data, but this interestingly is data that comes from a study we did on adrenal distress, 
using a tropho-restorative adrenal support for both improving insulin function and decreasing uh, adaptive stress. And the question we were asking here was if you gave a tropho-restorative or physiologically supportive adrenal formula, would that have any impact on insulin function or resistance? And here we see the results from an individual in that study where after just six weeks on a adaptogenic or tropho-restorative adrenal support formula, they had significant changes and improvement in two aspects of their insulin function or insulin resistance. One of these is called HOMA, H-O-M-A, HOMA, and the other is called glucose insulin ratio. Now, the HOMA is in on the left and in the light blue. The glucose insulin ratio is in the magenta. And as you see above HOMA, lower is better. So the fact that at T0, the HOMA was 5.72, and after six weeks at T2, it had decreased to 4.1, was a improvement in this HOMA. If we look at glucose insulin ratio, where higher is better, we see that at time zero, the glucose insulin ratio was 3.89, and at the second time point six weeks later, it had increased to 6.25. So by both of these measures, we find an improvement in insulin function by improving adrenal support. Here's another example, trophorestorative adrenal support formula taken for six weeks and an associated improvement in insulin function or a decrease in insulin resistance. Remember the HOMA lower is better, so the 6.39 on the far left going to 3.95 on the right shows an improvement in HOMA. And in terms of the glucose insulin ratio, higher is better. 4.25 at time zero, 6.49 at T2, six weeks later. In that same study, we looked at overall changes in the rhythm of cortisol. Cortisol, as you may remember, should be higher first thing in the morning when we get up, and it should generally go down later in the morning, possibly come up in the afternoon, and then quiet down in the evening before coming back up as we sleep. And you see the usual laboratory range in yellow and blue. And you see the results at time zero in dark blue of our study and at the second time point T2 in the magenta line. Now what you see at time zero in the dark blue line is that people started below the acceptable range. Their cortisol in the morning was too low. It tended to drift down by the afternoon and go up just a hair in the evening. That's an unhealthy cortisol rhythm. After just six weeks, you see in the magenta line an improvement in the morning cortisol. It hasn't gotten fully up into the usual range. Remember, it was only six weeks between the two uh, measurements. But during the day now, the person has better rhythm. So a tropho-restorative adrenal support program did improve cortisol hormone rhythms, and appreciably so, after just six weeks, but also improved the glucose insulin functionality. Now, you may be concerned about people who have high cortisol in the morning. And this is an example of what happens to an individual who has high cortisol but receives this tropho-restorative uh, adrenal support. You see, uh, again, the reference ranges are in yellow and light blue. The dark blue is the initial time zero, where the cortisol in the morning was uh, unusually elevated, uh, came down very quickly by late morning, and stayed reasonably flat throughout the rest of the day. Uh, that's the kind of uh, hormone change that people would normally say, gee, I'm Raring to go in the morning, but my get up and go has left by the late morning, and I try to do my productive work in the morning because in the afternoon I'm really not as fit for duty. 
Notice what happens after six weeks on this trophorestorative adrenal support. The first AM cortisol is now lower. It comes down and then comes back up in the afternoon and down in the evening. You see a restoration of rhythm after just six weeks on this trophorestorative adrenal support. And what about the people that have so-called normal or acceptable cortisol? How do they function if they have six weeks of a trophorestorative formula? And here we found better rhythm. We found that at T0, uh, they were in the acceptable range first in the morning, but came down to just barely acceptable late in the morning and stayed flat for the rest of the day. Whereas after the six weeks on the trophorestorative formula, their cortisol was a little higher in the morning. It came down later in the day as it should, and then went back up in the evening. Now there is still some physiologic and homeostatic adaptation that needs to take place. Six weeks does not complete the whole cycle, but we wanted to show that in as short as six weeks, you could favorably impact both cortisol rhythms as well as glucose insulin function across the board uh, for people who are either too high or too low or in acceptable ranges in the beginning. Now our clinical goals here are to think about and perhaps rethink inflammation, understanding it more deeply as repair deficit, and the primary cause of diabetes, metabolic syndrome, which you can think of as prediabetes. Our physiology first approach helps restore post-homeostasis. This is just a fancy way of saying self-regulation. And physiology uh, seeks health through uh, constantly bringing back into balance the individual through these self-regulating or homeostatic mechanisms. And there are predictive tests that can be applied functionally and individually. And uh, later in the uh, webinar, uh, I'll be suggesting uh, particularly important reference uh, tests and their healthy values uh, for you to use uh, in your clinical work. We summarize much of what we do as the alkaline way. This helps the immune system restore, repair, and defend the body. And for those who are interested in more detail about this, uh, my colleague Jay Srimani and I have a uh, chapter in Ingrid Kolstadt's text, Foods and Nutrients in, in Disease Management. Uh, and this is a chapter that deals with food reactivities, diagnosing and treating food allergies, intolerances, and celiac disease. Uh, and in the same text, we also have a chapter on diabetes and its management. So inflammation rethought is really repair deficits. The alkaline way uh, is an approach to lifelong repair. In conventional pathobiology, we think about what's wrong and how to fight it. In integrative physiology, we think about what's needed or what might be present uh, in excess, like excessive internal stress and autocoids or uh, external uh, toxins, and how to decrease the bad stuff and increase the good stuff. How do we make sure that people have sufficient antioxidant, buffering mineral, and other nutrients, uh, while also minimizing their internal distress and their exposure to toxins? Now, inflammation can be either acute or chronic, but in both cases, it reflects a lack of repair. So indeed, when we're healthy and we have an acute trauma, there's no need for swelling because the repair goes so quickly and completely that there is no inflammation. But if the repair can't quite keep up in the acute situation, there may be some swelling, some heat, some discomfort, that quickly resolves because the body is then able uh, to uh, reassert its repair competencies. Now in chronic inflammation, in chronic repair deficit, there are always one or more essential nutrient deficit, that specific deficit being uh, a block uh, to uh, healthy repair, or excess distress, the internal hormones of distress, the so-called autocoids, the self-made cortisone and cortisol, uh, which in excess can stop immune repair uh, as, a, uh, as a physiologic response to the excess of internally generating, generated stress hormones. There's also an adaptive immune system, 
So when the primary or innate immune system uh, has more challenge than it can manage, it calls in reserves, it calls in an enhanced immune system, an adaptive immune system that responds. And these are the sources of antibodies. Antibodies can be recent or IgM. They can be mucosal and secretory IgA. Uh, they can be systemic and have to do with surfaces and IgA. Or they can be long memory and have to do with IgG. All of the antibodies coming from plasma cells. And these plasma cells uh, are the antibody factories that are derived from B-class lymphocytes upon specific programming. There also are T cell lymphocytes. The T regulatory cells or the T cells uh, are able to interact and have immune responses without antibodies. So the body has multiple mechanisms, antibody mediated, T cell mediated, but also immune complex mediated. Uh, and uh, to understand the immune system fully and adequately, we must understand all of these delayed pathways. Now, there are communication molecules. They're called cytokines or interleukins. And these come from the PUFA, the polyunsaturated fatty acids. They're modulated by the PUFA fatty acids. And these PUFAs are either omega-6 or omega-3. The omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids tend to amplify the immune responses. They are pro-inflammatory. And in contrast, the omega-3 fatty acids uh, stimulate repair. Uh, they're the quieting uh, sources of cytokines. C-reactive protein uh, is a laboratory procedure. Uh, C-reactive protein, or CRP, is increased when the body has a repair need. Indeed, the C-reactive protein is the body's call for an amplified repair response when the local cells are not able to keep up with the repair uh, intensity that is needed. Now, identifying immune homeostasis is, uh, has been challenging in the past, uh, and that's why our laboratory developed an ex vivo uh, lymphocyte response assay. Ex vivo means that the uh, specimen reacts in the laboratory just as it does in the body. There's no change from how the cells react in the body in the LRA by ELISA Act system. It is an ELISA or amplified procedure, and it's the first ELISA to be done on the surface of a living cell. That's where the ACT part comes, the extension. So LRA is lymphocyte response assay by the ELISA Act method to get comprehensive measurements of immune responses for all delayed allergy pathways. And on the right, you see lymphocytes that have reacted positively in the laboratory uh, dish or well, uh, just as they would have reacted in the body, because everything is present in the laboratory, as would be in the body, with the absence of red cells. Uh, and um, the uh, ex vivo procedure is done uh, to allow us to communicate with the immune system uh, in the laboratory uh, and interrogate it or ask it what it's tolerant to and what it reacts against uh, in all delayed systems. Here we see uh, the wheel of immune responses. Uh, you see in the uh, upper left the type 1 uh, acute or IgE mediated responses. Uh, this is what usual skin tests or RAST type testing measures. And then there are type 2, which are antibodies, and they can be IgA or they can be IgM, or they can be IgG. Then you see below that and to the right clockwise type 3, which are immune complexes, and still further to the right um, clockwise, the type 4 direct T cell uh, responses, immune responses, that do not require antibodies. A lymphocyte response assay like ELISA ACT can measure all delayed pathways concurrently, that is its strength, uh, and uh, we'd be happy to send you the Townsend Letter for Doctors and Patients. Uh, 2010, the August-September issue, uh, had a discussion of this, uh, which we'd recommend for those who'd like further information. Now, we've done a study in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, uh, and I'd like to call attention to only one piece of that, which is that diabetes is an autoimmune disease. 
and therefore we wanted to measure the delayed allergic responses, the delayed hypersensitivity responses. And you see the data from the type 1 diabetics in red, and you see the data from the type 2 diabetics in gray. And you see with regard to sweeteners and the probability or proportion or percentage of people that had reactions to sweeteners was about the same in the type 1 and type 2 diabetic population. With regard to immune responses to toxic minerals, you find that the type 1 diabetics had a high prevalence of this, much less so in the type 2 diabetics. In terms of immune reactions to environmental chemicals or xenotoxins, uh, particularly high reactivity in the type 1 diabetics, but also high reactivity in the type 2 diabetics. And in terms of reactions against food additives, uh, a higher prevalence in type 1 than in type 2, but still appreciable in both populations. And in terms of cow dairy, type 1 diabetics had a lower and type 2 diabetics a higher prevalence of immune hypersensitivity or delayed allergies uh, to these categories of substances. This we uh, were privileged to publish in the Journal of the British Diabetic Association, uh, and it's uh, one of the references that supports uh, the premise that we have, which is identifying the delayed allergens and substituting for those allows the immune system to repair, especially if we provide uh, the essential nutrients, uh, a, a tolerant diet that substitutes for the immune reactive foods and chemicals and adds targeted supplementation to correct deficits, but also includes physical and mental activities to evoke human healing responses. Now this physiology first approach uh, is about identifying and substituting immune reactants so you can break the cycle and then adding nutritional protocols that stimulate repair. The alkaline way is a way of eating in conformance with this health by evidence approach. It is largely a plant-based diet with a preference for biodynamic or organic or community-supported agriculture, locally vine-ripened whole foods. It emphasizes the importance of individually sufficient antioxidants. For example, we recommend all eight forms of vitamin E, the natural mixed forms of tocopherols, along with selenomethionine, because selenomethionine is essential to activate vitamin E. We recommend ascorbates and glutathione. We recommend balanced Bs, from which the NAD and FAD that shuttle the electrons are derived. We recommend natural carotenoids, the mixed natural carotenoid forms, as well as coenzyme Q10 when needed. We recommend prebiotic fibers, probiotic organisms, uh, and appropriate essential cofactors, including carnitine, so that metabolism can be enhanced. And we're privileged to have a chapter on this subject that will be out next year uh, in uh, Ron Watson's uh, textbook uh, published by Elsevier. And our chapter will be on diabetes as an autoimmune dysfunction syndrome in the Bioactive Foods and Chronic Disease Stage series. Now, what about tests uh, that are evidence-based and use healthy uh, ranges? Uh, we see that the relative risk, according to physiology, has only a few critically important markers to measure. The first, if we want to know about repair deficit or inflammation, high sensitivity CRP, HSCRP, is an excellent global measure of repair deficit or inflammation. And the healthy target is an HSCRP of less than 0.5, a high sensitivity C-reactive protein of less than 0.5. So 0.5 or below is the range that healthy people have for high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And if the HSCRP is above that level, it suggests a progressively higher degree to which the body is calling for help due to some area where repair is blocked. With regard to communication and methylation and detoxification, here we recommend measuring homocysteine, and the healthy homocysteine value is less than 6. We also recommend measuring antioxidant status, and the best current measure that uh, is directly an assessment of antioxidant status is whether you have oxidized fats in the HDL or LDL fractions. 
And in order to uh, assess this, when you have adequate protective antioxidants, the oxidized HDL and LDL will be undetectable or zero. In terms of adrenal health, we recommend measuring salivary or plasma cortisol and DHEA. It's really the ratio of cortisol to DHEA uh, that is the set point for the hormonal control system. We recommend measuring cortisol and DHEA at four different time points uh, to assess both rhythm uh, and adequacy or excess or deficit in these important modulating hormones. And last, fifth, the metabolic status. Here we recommend measuring first AM, first morning urine pH with the healthy range of 6.5 to 7.5. And when we look at repair deficit, which is inflammation, as well as methylation and detoxification, as well as antioxidant status, adrenal or hormonal health, and metabolic status, we've looked at the upstream critical set. When these are in healthy ranges, the rest of the body is in homeostatic self-regulatory states. And when these indicators are out of their healthy range, then we would want to work to stimulate repair or to improve communication or to provide sufficient antioxidants or supportive uh, adrenal hormones or metabolic uh, buffers uh, to the uh, excess acids if they're found. Now let's look in a bit more detail at some of these particulars. First, integrated primary tests and their healthy values. We mentioned the importance of pH as a measure of metabolism. In this case, the first morning urine, that means after six or more hours of rest, does assess metabolic acidosis or status. 6.5 to 7.5 is the healthy range. Healthy people may uh, concentrate a little bit of acid in their urine putting it below the neutral point of 7, but not below 6.5. And they will not have uh, a first morning urine equilibrated value above 7.5. Uh, if it is above 7.5 consistently, that might be catabolic illness, uh, and uh, another approach would be needed. With regard to detoxification and communication, this has to do with methylation factors, and these in turn relate to the homocysteine where we want a healthy value of less than six. And uh, this was written up in an uh, article in Townsend Letter for Doctors and Patients for those who'd like more information. Now, what do we do if we find that the first morning urine pH is outside the healthy range of 6.5 to 7.5? Well, the first thing we think about physiologically is that the person has a difficulty to taking up the minerals that might be in their intestines. And so we would want to enhance their magnesium uptake, providing them 220 to 1,320 milligrams a day of ionized magnesium. And at each time, they would take a teaspoon of choline citrate that provides 1,300 milligrams of choline citrate to go with 220 milligrams of ionized magnesium. That would be one dose. And you would take anywhere from two doses, which would give you 440 milligrams of ionized magnesium and 2,600 milligrams of choline citrate, all the way up to six doses a day if needed uh, to bring the first morning urine pH back into the healthy 6.5 to 7.5 range. And if the person needed six doses a day, then they would get 1,320 milligrams of ionized magnesium and 7,800 milligrams of choline citrate. We adjust the number of doses to the first morning urine pH when it is persistently below 6.5, we increase buffering minerals in the diet, as well as ionized magnesium and choline citrate supplementation. On the bottom of this slide, you see uh, a word about detoxification or methylation factors for communication. And the uh, healthiest people have a homocysteine of less than 6. And we recommend here uh, a sublingual form, because the under-the-tongue form is more easily taken up. And very often, people have difficulty absorbing some of their methylation factors. So we recommend a sublingual form that has 2 milligrams of hydroxycobalamin, 2.5 milligrams of natural folate, 10 milligrams of B6. And you take 1 to 10 doses a day uh, as needed to keep the homocysteine below 6.
So the number of doses of this methylation detoxification formula is based on the homocysteine level, uh, and you take as many doses as needed to bring the homocysteine uh, into a healthy uh, range of less than six. With regard to metabolic acidosis and first morning urine pH, metabolic acidosis just means an excess of acid in the cells, including in the kidneys. There are a number of medical tests, including arterial or venous blood gases with ionized calcium and ionized magnesium. Uh, these are usually done on hospitalized patients or in hospital settings. You can look at serum electrolytes, and if the chloride is elevated, that is an indicator of metabolic acidosis and reason to look further. But there are other reasons for metabolic acids being uh, elevated, including an increase in lactate from the standard American diet or ketones from the diabetes of the individual. Um, and so we uh, highly recommend measuring at home by each person their first morning urine pH. And as Julian Seifter pointed out in Cecil's medicine textbook, acidosis can be dangerous if untreated. Many cases respond well to treatment. Our clinical goals in this webinar have been to rethink inflammation and to understand it as repair deficit, to look at the causal factors for diabetes and prediabetes as metabolic syndrome, to look at a physiology first approach to restore self-regulation and homeostasis, by a predictive test that can be applied functionally and individually, referencing healthy values. The alkaline way is an overriding approach that we've synthesized to support immune defense and repair systems so they can restore, repair, and defend the body. In essence, we are the result of the choices we make about what we eat, drink, think, and do. And when we pay attention to what we eat, drink, think, and do, we have tools and availability to restore ourselves uh, in uh, remarkable ways. At this point, I'd be happy to unmute the lines. Uh, and if any of you have questions, you're welcome to either uh, type them in uh, through your chat um, or uh, speak them through your phone. And I will do my best uh, to uh, respond. Uh, this uh, webinar will be archived, uh, and we'd be happy to have you uh, review it. Um, several people uh, have asked about the difference between type 1.5 and type 3 diabetes. Um, and uh, the difference is that if you both require insulin and have insulin resistance, then you have type 3. But if you have insulin dysregulation, so you have ineffective insulin and also defects in the receptor to insulin, then you have the intermediate type 1.5. Um, HOMA is the homeostatic assessment uh, of uh, glucose regulation. That's what uh, HOMA stands for. That was a question. And uh, someone asks about body weight. And if it can be too low in some diabetics, and indeed, yes, uh, one of the uh, challenges, one of the issues uh, in regard to, uh, hi there, uh, one of the issues in regard to uh, diabetes uh, is that there are uh, both uh, overweight and underweight diabetics. Uh, the thin diabetic tends to be more brittle, uh, that is, they need to uh, regulate their blood sugar uh, more exquisitely uh, so that it doesn't go too high, it doesn't go too low. Uh, and uh, that is a challenge very often. The question about uh, lean diabetics or thin diabetics, uh, they tend to be more brittle. Uh, they do have problems with uh, fat retention as well as uh, insulin dysfunctions. Um, and uh, they do need to be monitored more carefully. There's also a question about uh, whether there's a difference between natural and synthetic forms of nutrients. Uh, yes, very often the synthetic form is a work-alike. That is, uh, it addresses a particular function uh, but ignores some others. For example, 
uh, there was an important study not too long ago. And that study looked at the effects of vitamin E on heart disease, especially in people at risk of diabetes. And what the study found seemed counterintuitive. That is, it found that at higher levels of vitamin E, 800 IU of D-alpha tocopherol succinate, there was a less benefit to the heart than if you had given 400 units of D-alpha tocopherol succinate. Now that's really not surprising when we look at how vitamins E works because the D-alpha tocopherol, the D-alpha form of vitamin E, does not bind or help the heart at all. That's where the gamma tocopherol comes in. So the reason we use, recommend, and have always used only the mixed natural forms of vitamins E is because they have different locations in the body where they're active, and we need all of them to serve the whole body. There's a question about the importance of activity and exercise and conditioning for diabetics. And while it's important for all of us, it's especially important for diabetics to have a, a healthy weight-bearing exercise routine, as well as a healthy uh, stretching and um, endurance building part of activity. It turns out that just 20 minutes of each every other day is enough to significantly improve outcomes and lower risk. So it does not require a lot of time, but it does require some effort. It doesn't require uh, an intensive uh, workout. Uh, it turns out that walking two miles, uh, which for most people uh, would mean about a half an hour or 10,000 steps, uh, is equivalent uh, to a significant 15 to 30 percent reduction uh, in risk uh, compared to people who are uh, sitting and more sedentary. And more recently, a number of studies have suggested that just sitting is itself part of the challenge. Uh, it decreases core muscle uh, strength and endurance uh, and seems to be an independent risk factor. So uh, getting up from your chair, including the chair at which you sit by your computer or the screens that you watch, getting up every 15 to 20 minutes uh, to stretch and to move about uh, is an important way of reducing your risk uh, from being sedentary or sitting. Question about uh, the cause of autoimmune thyroiditis. Um, uh, and uh, uh, indeed, uh, thyroiditis is uh, a repair deficit. Uh, all itises are repair deficits. All of the things we call inflammatory are repair deficits. Um, and in the case of thyroiditis, the antithyroid antibodies are made inside the gland when the blood thyroid barrier becomes permeable because of wear and tear leading to a need for repair. When the repair isn't done, then the blood thyroid barrier breaks down. The immune cells, the lymphocytes, come into the thyroid. They want to repair the blood thyroid barrier. And as a consequence, they produce the antithyroid antibodies. So when the... Uh, body is restored uh, to health uh, when the repair is enhanced by uh, adequate antioxidants, by adequate buffering minerals, by correcting uh, the antioxidant deficit in oxidative stress, uh, by correcting the acidosis and restoring buffering minerals, then the body is able to repair. And when it repairs, it repairs systemically. It repairs the blood thyroid barrier, and then you have a sustainable remission from thyroiditis. Now, if we are too acidic, what are the best ways to repair? The first is to have a diet that is rich in alkaline-forming foods. And uh, we have a chart of food effects on body chemistry on a number of our websites and available for you to download. Uh, you should see on the bottom of your screen now links to a number of websites that should be of interest to you, including the American Nutrition Association, Perk Integrative Health, Better lab tests now for those interested in direct access lab testing. ELISA Act Biotechnologies for those interested in lymphocyte response assay and how those programs uh, can be helpful. And there is tomorrow a webinar sponsored by ELISA Act Biotechnologies on endometriosis. For any of you who are interested, you're welcome uh, to uh, link to that and register for that through the second from the bottom. Uh, and the bottom, the uh, ELISA Act Endometriosis, a Physiology First Approach. 
uh, you're welcome to uh, join us for that uh, webinar. Um, there's a question about electromagnetic fields uh, and uh, their impact on diabetes risk. Uh, this is a very interesting area for which we need more studies. Uh, there definitely does seem to be links in some people between electromagnetic fields or EMF or especially extremely low frequency ELF fields uh, and the risk of dysregulation or the risk of uh, insulin resistance. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for asking that question. Well, it's been a pleasure to share with you uh, what we've learned over the last decades as we've been able to rethink the causes rather than the consequences, particularly in regard to diabetes, uh, an area where we've had a privilege of, of doing uh, successful outcome studies in both type 1 and type 2 to test this approach. And we find that the long-term results are even more satisfying uh, people find that living and eating the alkaline way is preferred uh, and that targeted supplementation along with mental and physical exercises to balance out uh, a healthy healing response are quite sufficient in most cases to establish remission, to restore tolerance in the immune system, which means ability to repair, uh, and to maintain a healthy blood sugar energy activity level uh, so that uh, we uh, are able to sustain uh, our immune defense and repair system, as well as our hormonal and neurochemical system, as well as our digestive and detoxification systems. All of these depend upon the energy that comes in the first place from sugar, and when not available from sugar, the body reaches either to fats or amino acids for backup energy. It's been a privilege to present this information. I especially appreciate the invitation from the American Nutrition Association and from Michael Stroka. Uh, so may you all be well and happy, and may we join again to understand health from a more physiologic and more dynamic functional point of view. Thank you all. Be well.